Football moves masses and generates billions of dollars around the world. The United Nations is now using this popular sport as a new way of diplomacy. It wants to create a better understanding among people, communities and governments through Football for Peace. That's an initiative established in 2006 by FIFA and Chilean legend Elias Figueroa. It was revamped six years ago by Kashyap Siddiqui, a British footballer of Ugandan and Pakistani Indian descent. Siddiqui wants to use his multi-ethnic background and experience to draw the world's attention to a cause dear to his heart, Kashmir. An issue that has pitted India against Pakistan for more than 70 years. The 33-year-old footballer even decided to leave his team, Oxford United, and join Rayal Kashmir, carrying a message of peace to a region in conflict. Footballer Kashif Siddiqui talks to Al Jazeera. Kashif Siddiqui, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Uh, thank you for having me, appreciate it. Uh, in 2013, you co-founded the charity Football for Peace. Tell me a bit about that. Yeah, um, it's certainly been a, a, a journey with Football for Peace. It actually launched right here at the United Nations in 2006 by the late uh, Kofi Annan. Our co-founder is a FIFA legend, Elias Figueroa. Um, he played the likes of Pele, Maradona. And I was fortunate enough to co-found the charity in 2013 internationally. And today, Football for Peace is at the forefront of using the influence of global football to highlight the most pressing issues we face around the world today. In, in the UK, you've been involved particularly in tackling knife crime and gang violence. Yeah, that's right. I think, you know, social harms in all forms. And I, I really believe that football's a great healer, both preventative and reconciliation. And we're really advocating in the UK that football can be used as a, a, a real tool to bring communities together in divided times. It's been described, uh, not by you, I have to say, but by others as being at the forefront of the global war against extremism. Uh, which certainly sounds pretty ambitious. You've mentioned some of the high-profile celebrity and political backers. You've taken this to the Pope, I understand. Yeah, I mean, my personal mission isn't against extremism on, uh, on terrorism. I think football is advocating for everything that we're facing in the planet, whether it's climate, whether it's the issues around gender equality. I think football's, football, the universal language, can do so much more. It's touching 3.5 billion people globally. And I really believe that football is such a neutralizer in so many aspects. And obviously there are issues around extremism and terrorism and if Football for Peace can have a contribution to that area, it's incredible. Um, I think I've been really fortunate to get the support that I have internationally. Uh, Pope Francis is a great believer in sport doing better. Um, he's, re he's a real advocate for faith and sport working hand in hand. Um, some of the other dignitaries that I have on board, for me it's um, humbling. But at the same time, I really think that if you look at PSG, Real Madrid, Manchester City, they've got the best teams around the world. And if I can build the best team on my side, the message is going to move so much faster. Um, the best players move the ball much quicker. Mm. So if I can have world leaders supporting the message of football, doing good and being a force for good, I think that message will go across the world a lot quicker. And you've extended your reach this year into the General Assembly. You were speaking to world leaders there. What was the message you had for them and what was the feedback you got? Yeah, um, I think it's this, for me it's again advocating the power of football um, in all forms and I spoke about how football can actually contribute to saving lives. It can save lives against misunderstanding, it saves lives against violence, hate, division, um, prejudice and the message was really on how we can collectively work across the world, governments working and foreign ministers actually working closer with sports ministers on how we can actually tackle some of the most pressing issues your biggest challenge yet, a somewhat unorthodox loan from your current club, yeah. Oxford United, to Real Kashmir. Real Kashmir is a club that started from scratch three years ago. Some of those guys had never played football before. Yeah. It's situated in the middle of one of the most hotly disputed, militarized areas on earth with India and Pakistan talking now about going to war over it. Why? Why have you done it? I think um, my mother's journey has really inspired me. Conflict is no, um, it's, it's nothing new in our family. She came from a, uh, a, a broken home. She faced a lot of issues as a single mother. Um, she came from Idi Amin's conflict from Uganda. And she's actually been the real driving force in my life and now even further driving input to, for me to go because she really believes that I've got a message to deliver. 
Um, as much as I'm a, a footballer playing on the pitch, outside of it I carry a message of peace. Um, and if I can bring that to the youth of Kashmir that need it at such hard times, I think this for me could be something, a real testing ground of, I've been advocating for the power of football and football diplomacy and what that can do. And, you know, having that together, I think it's, it's a real, yet to be seen, but a contribution for my aspect on what I can deliver in that region. Breaking in uh, as a South Asian player in, in the United Kingdom yep. wasn't easy. You've talked about facing racial abuse on the pitch. Tell me a little bit about that journey and how it felt breaking barriers as you Yeah, sure. And generally, obviously, you will know that there's not many South Asian professional footballers in the UK, and this has been a real issue. The FA is still, you know, having to put together a report on what needs to be done to get Asians in football, whether it's racism, whether it's discrimination. Um, it's been a tough journey, um, but I think, again, it's been tough on many uh, aspects for me. Again, coming back to having a single mother who's, who's come over from Uganda and not really knowing the English system of football, but understanding what, what sport could do for me at that a young age and getting me into it. I think um, being from a South Asian descent has been difficult at times. Um, the other part of it is injuries. I've had so many injuries in my career and I've almost uh, retired from football twice. And it's been my mother who said to me, no, just keep going, one more chance, one more chance. And uh, you know, it's, it's mentally, physically and just spiritually draining. Um, but that's why I think the charitable work has kept me sane, kept me, you know, mentally strong. But I, I really advocate that. It's really been parental uh, mother support that's kept me in going. One of the things I read which had an impact on me about your story was a, a line about talking about racial abuse, abuse on the pitch. Some fans on social media, you've said, said they were looking forward to seeing a Pakistani footballer throwing bombs down the wing. <laughs> this must have been difficult to endure and still keep your focus and still get out there day after day. Yeah, I think, you know, as a player, what, what all you can do is train every day. Train as hard as you can. Um, I think social media has opened up a lot of space for all sorts of things. Um, hence, I try and stay away from social media. But um, I think um, mentally it's something that um, you, you, you have to learn to fight it in so many different ways and be strong about the situation. And this is why now I feel that I'm, I'm a lot more rounded person from all the experiences that I've had, all the, the travels that football's given me. Football's given me a lot of negatives, but it's given me far more positives in my life. And I'm hoping that I can take that to the next stage right now. You've spoken about your mother, the extent to which she's been an inspiration on you. Uh, you've also pointed to your faith as a key driver in what you do. Yeah, I think, you know, growing up as a young Muslim boy, um, charity is a big part of our faith and that's always been something that I've done from a young age. Mum has instilled it in me. I think being very humble and fortunate, um, of obviously she's come from a very difficult background and she's always taught me to not look at what others have but look at others what don't have and that's really been my values in life and something that I've tried to build within the charity and the work that I do and the pairs that I meet. Um, and I think hopefully if I can try and give any message to people it's really about love and respect and peace. And in terms, again, of the, the sort of barriers you've had to break down as a player, you touched upon medical mishap. Yeah. E effectively, it ended your professional career. A mistake by a doctor, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was actually in America, um, a misdiagnosed surgery. Um, unfortunately, they first I was diagnosed as a, a hernia operation. When they went in, they realized it wasn't a hernia. Six MRIs later, they realized it was a, a hip labrum tear. And when they went in, they cut the wrong nerve. Hmm. Um, but I take these things in my stride. It, somewhere along the line, this has all been a blessing for me because I wouldn't be sitting here with you if I didn't face all the circumstances that I have. And it's just trying to bring all of that together. Hmm. And this is why I'm so passionate about the work that I'm really trying to do. It certainly propelled you in a different direction. Where do you imagine you might have been otherwise? Do you think about that? Uh, it's difficult at times because I think... You were on a trajectory, weren't you? Yes, I mean, um, from a footballing perspective, definitely. Um, Arsenal Academy player, yeah, Northampton. Exactly. A and it would have been up from there. But I think, you know, in life sometimes you, you're given opportunity uh, in different ways. And I think this Football for Peace was my calling. It wasn't football. Football was supposed to give me a platform for the work I'm about to embark on. I think I've got the foundations, but I think there's a long way to go, but I'm getting closer and closer. 
and um, yeah, I think that's really what I would think would uh, with the reason why where I am today. In terms of the work of your charity, you've been doing this for six years now. You will have accumulated quite some experience, yeah, and a program in your mind of how it works, spreading your message, overcoming barriers, bridging divides mm -hmm. through sport. Give me a sense of how that has worked for you. Give me an example of where you've seen this actually operating, actually succeeding. Yeah, um, we've been working in vulnerable cities, marginalised communities around the world. Um, one of the key examples for us was making Birmingham a city for peace. It was the first city for peace uh, that we launched in Birmingham. We're very fortunate the Duke of Cambridge got behind it, Prince William, and since he's been to our London City for Peace program as well. The real aim of Football for Peace is trying to create these, these cities where we can bring divided youth from all back, backgrounds together, whether it's religion, culture, ethnicity, and really getting football to advocate that it doesn't matter where you come from or your background is. It's more of an educational program that these children go through, and it's a one-year program when we hit about 3,000 to 5,000 children, that's when we kite market with the mayor of the city as a city for peace. These children are taught UN SDGs, they're taught, they're taught leadership, conflict resolution, some of the most pressing issues and what, how they can advocate for their own communities. Um, they then go on to train another 17 to 14 year old children. So it's really a really youth sports movement that we're building. Um, and the plan is to really try and have 25 to 50 cities for peace around the world over the next five years and that's something that I spoke about at the UN General Assembly. It sounds terrifically aspirational, it sounds fantastic in theory. Give me a sense of tangible result. The tangible result for us is to see real change in the youth. For example, we had two events. We had uh, Abdul Ghaffar who flew out, who's been a young peace leader, who actually talked about where he would have been if he didn't go through a Football for Peace program. He grew up in a very hostile environment and today he's addressing heads of states himself. He opened a gala with Prince Ali of Jordan for us and now he's back in his community, he's working, he's been through a program and unfortunately he just a couple of weeks ago he got into a, um, a con I guess a, a conflict on a zebra crossing where someone pulled a knife out on him and if he hadn't gone through a Football for Peace program he actually said he would have pulled something out as well and it would have gone the other way. Instead, he apologised and he tried to get away from the situation as fast as he could. The respect that he has for himself, his family, he's got a lot more belonging and self-esteem now. And I think that's what Football for Peace is really trying to get at the grassroots level. You have played football professionally for Pakistan. You're part Indian in terms of heritage. You're about to find yourself in the eye of potentially an absolutely enormous potentially even nuclear storm when you mm. head towards Kashmir. Does that worry you, the militarism of it, the danger, what's at stake? Mm. <clears throat> I think um, for me I use it as an exciting part of my next journey. I'm not really thinking about the negatives, I'm thinking about the positives of what I can bring and what it's going to bring to me as an individual. Um, I do, the only thing I do worry about is my family and what they're thinking, but my wife and my mother have been very supportive of the whole thing. I think um, having the PM, uh, having listened to the PM and having listened to the news, I can definitely, I can definitely see that this is, will be by far the most challenging issue that I'm going to be in. And um, having played for the Pakistan national team, having heritage from India, my father, I think there is no other better message that football, it doesn't matter where you come from, what heritage you come from, football is about bringing people together. And I think this for me is that is the message, going to the region, and that's something that I'm trying to advocate for as well. How much do you know about what to expect? So far, I mean, from the club's perspective, we, we have a Scottish manager in Real Kashmir, he's been, he's been living there and we've had conversations and he's been very, very positive. Um, but yes, there will be security issues. Uh, we, have, we have armed guards with us all the time. Uh, I myself will be under protection, etc. Um, it's not your normal loan move and it's not your normal football training sessions, but um, I guess then I'm not a normal individual who's ha having played for the Pakistan national team and going out to India in the middle of potential conflict. And an extraordinary team. By all accounts, it must be real Kashmir. Uh, uh, it's been described as a fairy tale. It's pretty miraculous under the circumstances, going from nothing in three years to 
seriously competitive in the Indian League. You must go out there with a, a sense of admiration for your co-players before you've even met them. Oh yeah, definitely. I think it's what they've achieved so far, it's unbelievable. And I think that really comes down to their drive and the passion that the players have. When they're playing Mumbai FC, Mumbai were really rattled and they didn't know what to do. Um, I think when, when you're facing Kashmir, you're not facing a normal football team. You are facing a team that has got a lot to prove and they're really, really fighting with their heart on their sleeve. Um, and again, that's another challenge for me because I have to go out there, I have to prove myself. Aside from everything else off, off the pitch, I need to be focusing on the pitch. Um, and Kashmir, Real Kashmir is one of the most followed teams in Asia now, very high profile. And I hope we can contribute and hopefully win title and I think Real Kashmir can certainly do that and what a message that, that would send. Mm. Of course you can't lose sight of the fact that whilst you have this admiration for the players and they are truly admirable no doubt they're also players under tremendous strain at the moment ha having left Kashmir on August the 5th as the curtain came down essentially the curfew and security culture controls imposed by the Indian government they got out just in time many of them have had little contact with their families yeah. since uh, it's a pretty difficult situation to be playing sport under uh, and a difficult situation in which you join them yeah no definitely I think when I spoke to um, uh, the managers and I spoke to the owners it was a sad time because during Eid celebrations the players couldn't speak to their families. Uh, one of the owners actually, he sent a message around to all the families from the players and I think that really touched me because I was, that, that to me is, is, is very difficult but um, I think this is something that I'm going with, with a lot of thought and on even personal relationships with players. It's, it's not your normal lo locker room banter that you have in Oxford United. It's a completely different environment and that's something I think would be a, a real interesting um, new aspect to me. At some point, the curfew will be lifted, the security controls one assumes will be lifted, the team will once again be playing in Kashmir, Indian yeah. administered Kashmir. You'll be aware of the warnings made by the Pakistani Prime Minister here in New York, yeah. Imran Khan, who said that would unleash a backlash by Kashmiris on the ground which would be followed by a bloodbath with hundreds of thousands of Indian soldiers on the ground and that in turn could unleash war. This is an extraordinary political situation. Do you think about that? Uh, you've, you've mentioned that you do but yeah. what do you think about when you consider the consequences? Um, for me again I think the only thing I think about, I'm, I'm a very aspirational person, I've been so positive with all the challenges that I've faced in my life and I just hope that me being there, that hopefully it doesn't get to that stage, but uh, me being there and the time I'm there, if I can have any contribution to the youth of Kashmir, to, to other players, um, and give them hope of what I'm trying to achieve. And I really want to bring my influence and my network and my personality to this region. And if I can bring any, any resource from global to help the situation, I'd love to do that. I think your optimism is hugely admirable and, 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 and very apparent in this interview. I want to tap into what's really in your heart because this is an enormous step that you're taking. Yeah. Arguably the biggest you've taken yet. As a human being, you must have a sense of what you are stepping into. You know, John, it's funny because um, many people have asked me over the last couple of weeks, um, they've said to me, are you naive? Are you stupid? What are you doing? Um, and you know what my answer is, is that if anyone is going to try and change the world, they have to be a little bit stupid. <laughs> <laughs> in your wandering the halls in the UN, have you had an opportunity to speak to any diplomats from the Indian mission or the Pakistani mission? Have you had any inside information, any background chats? For me, you know, I'm carrying a message of peace um, and for me the most important thing is, is to try to because I don't really understand the political situation like you said it, it's so deep uh, it goes back so many years so many years three conflicts um, for me it's not a political thing it's a sport it's football and for me I'm trying to stay out of it and really and, and stay on the path of my message is this and this is what I want to achieve um, I think sometimes if I, before I get there, if I try and indulge too much, I think then 
could it, could it be worse for myself thinking you know deeper into the situation etc so um, I haven't really spoken to anyone about the situation or tried to understand more on what's really happening or why it's happening. So you spent time at the General Assembly, you had the opportunity to address uh, some of the leaders at least. What was the feedback that you got back from them? Was it a useful opportunity? Yes, definitely. We've had, we've had a great conversation since. I think um, the conversation we're trying to take is to the next level of how football can really influence at the grassroots level is really about bringing diplomatic impact to community impact and bridging that divide and we've had we've hosted conversations in a symposium around the power of the diplomatic political football world coming together and I think the foreign ministers and some of the other ministers that we've discussed the, the scenarios with are really interested on how we can actually take this conversation across five continents and host conversations across five continents including bringing potentially the NFL and um, the Amer American football here is the Super Bowl alone is t touches 260 million people and I think that power of football in all forms could be really interesting. Cash, tell me how you got into football as a child. What was your journey into this game? How did you develop a love for it? I think it's every boy's dream growing up in England. You know, it's, it's the home of football for me. It's the home of football for many children around the world actually. The Premier League is the world's biggest league now. The Championship is the fourth biggest league in the world. That sums up English football. Um, and growing up in England, it's every boy's dream to kick a ball, play, you know, trying to break into but some was kind this of something you started at school? Yeah. Um, and just I had a natural talent, natural aptitude? Not even school. This was just, you know, playing in the garden before and, you know, trying to play with other children, etc. Um, but yeah, it was through school that then maybe I had uh, the opportunity to play for um, Middlesex County, etc. And my mother actually finding out on how she could get me into professional clubs or how do I get a trial, how do I get scouted. And she was, you know, going around knocking on doors, making phone calls. And how do I get cash into a team? And unfortunately, you touched on, on some of the racism elements of it. Um, I don't know if it's racism. I don't like to call, call it racism. I just call it misunderstanding because I believe that people probably misunderstood. And if you can make them understand, then they'll probably think otherwise. But um, there's times when uh, Mum and I turned up to a football team and they said there's, there's no space, we're fully, we're fully booked. Um, this is way before professional, the Sunday league. Um, we've got a full squad, etc. But then other children that turned up were accepted on the team. And this is not just, it's not like you get paid. You pay to play Sunday league football. So my mum was actually willing to pay and they weren't taking money. So it wasn't even easy at that stage, in, at a grassroots level. But my breakthrough really came through um, playing Middlesex County and then going into the professional teams um, and having been scouted and then staying in, staying in the system really. Was there a moment growing up that you can recall when you thought this is it, this is my path, this is my calling? There's many moments um, when I thought this, this is it, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the system and I'm, I'm you know, breaking through. Um, but again, I think it's... Um, Life is uh, not, I think it's not about choices, it's about, you know, some things are written already. Do you think about the future? Do you think about what's next? Do you have bigger plans, bigger goals? I'm hoping that me playing in Kashmir will send a real strong message to everyone that I'm really walking the walk of football for peace. Um, my background and my heritage is, is really football for peace. When I'm going there is football for peace. Um, and if I can come out strong with that message, my plan is to really position the brand of Football for Peace between FIFA and the United Nations and become the goodwill of uh, world football and advocate for one million young peace leaders to come out of our programs and really affect change within their communities. It's almost creating a ripple effect. And if I can create that ripple effect, whether it's from Kashmir, London or New York, I'm hoping that that message will carry on when I'm not here. Cash, we wish you lots of luck and thanks again for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you, Jen. I'm going to need it. Keep in your prayers.